All right, well, hello, sixth grade. We're now moving on with chapter two, and we're starting here with steps of multiplying fractions. So we're getting into multiplying fractions, and when we talk about fractions and multiplying them, today's assignment is going to incorporate whole numbers into that with fractions. It's going to incorporate mixed numbers. And so these are things that you've done before. So this is gonna be more of a review but we're gonna take uh, some time here on today's video to make sure we understand that. First, you'll see what I've got here in the screen. Four steps to multiplying fractions. You're gonna to wanna to write these down, take a screenshot or something. So please take the time to pause and do that now. Okay, so now we're back. These are steps of multiplying fractions and we will re recite these, we will say these in class. Number one, make everything a fraction. Step two, cross check. Step three, multiply. Step four, simplify. So once again, steps of multiplying fractions. Step one, make everything a fraction. Step two, cross check. Step three, multiply. Step four, simplify. So that is what we are getting into. That is what we're looking at here today. So let's actually get to looking at those and what that means. Well, step one, if we look at example one, was to make everything a fraction. Well, everything is a fraction. Three-fourths times eight over 15. Everything already is a fraction, so we can leave that alone. Step two was to cross-check. Now, I am not sure whether or not you are familiar with cross-checking, okay? But I'm going to show you cross-checking because it makes that final step of simplifying your fraction much, much easier. In fact, if you do the cross-checking correctly, you can avoid the last step simplifying altogether. When we cross-check, we match up these numbers, the 3 and the 15 and the 4 and the 8. Now, I'm going to go ahead and circle these, but only on this example. You match up the 3 and the 15, you match up the eight and the four. That's how they always match up. It's not gonna be necessary to circle them. That's not required. I'm only gonna do that on this one just to show you that it's this numerator and this denominator, this denominator, this numerator, they get matched together. And what you do then is you ask yourself, is there a number other than one that can go into both three and 15? So this is now a review of factors finding the factors of the number. We are looking for a common factor, a number that can go into both three and 15. This is where, once again, knowing those multiplication and division tables, very important. And so we're gonna say, okay, the number that can go into both three and 15 evenly is three. It can't be one. I mean, yes, one can go into both of them, but when we divide by one, nothing changes. So you don't use one as a factor. So. Uh, we're thinking that 3 is the number that can go into both 3 and 15. So we're going to think, okay, well, we're going to think 3 divided by 3, and that's 1. Uh, let me get this here where I can write a little better. Then we're going to do 15 divided by 3. 15 divided by 3 is 5. And you can see how I literally cross them off and put the new number. And that's what I'm going to want you to do. It doesn't necessarily look real neat, but you can kind of show your work and still make it look pretty neat. Then we're gonna think, well, four and eight. Now, right away we might say, well, those are even numbers, so they're both, they're, they are both divisible by two, and that's true. And that would not be wrong to divide them both by two and then go ahead and multiply. However, to really eliminate the simplifying at step six, okay, you want to divide by the biggest possible number. And the biggest possible number that can go into both four and eight is four. So you're gonna think, well, four divided by four is one, and eight divided by four is two, all right? And so, and eight divided by four is two. So we can go ahead and uh, make that happen. So now I'm ready for step three, uh, which is to multiply. And so I just multiply the numerators, one times two. One times two is two. Then I multiply these denominators, one times five. 
One times five is five, and I end up with two over five. Now, step four always, always tells us to simplify. Even if you're confident that you have made these numbers as small as they can possibly be, okay, uh, it's good to simplify. And if you're not sure how to figure out if a number is in simplest form, the way I like to think, at it, think of it as is, you know a fraction is in simplest form if the only number that can go into both the numerator and the denominator is one. And so I'm looking for a number other than 1 that can go into both 2 and 5. Well, there isn't 1. The only common factor of 2 and 5 is 1. And once again, dividing things by 1 is not going to change anything. So 2 fifths is in simplest form. All right, moving right along. 7 times 5 over 14. Well, step 1 tells us to make everything a fraction. Here I have a whole number. To make a whole number a fraction... I just put it over 1, okay? Remember, a fraction is just a fancy way of, of writing a division problem. 7 divided by 1 is 7, and 7 was my original number. So I make, a, I make whole numbers fractions by putting them over 1. Now I want to cross-check. When I look at the 1 and the 5, I realize, well, there is no number other than 1 that can go into both 1 and 5. So my 1 and 5 are not going to change, okay? You can't always cross-check. Sometimes you can cross-check both ways, like we did in the first example. Sometimes you're not going to be able to cross-check at all. And here's an example where we are going to be able to cross-check one way. No other number besides 1 can go into both 1 and 5. But we have 7 and 14, and both 7 and 14 are divisible by 7. 7 divided by 7 is 1. 14 divided by 7 is 2. All right, and I just crossed that out and changed that. Now that I've cross-checked, I'm ready to multiply. So I come over here. 1 times 5 is 5. 1 times 2 is 2. And I end up with 5 over 2. And technically, that is in simplest form. Because simplest form, by definition, is that the only number that can go into both of them is 1. And sure enough, the only number that can evenly go into both 5 and 2 is 1. However, Mr. Swack, in this situation, is not going to accept 5 over 2 as a final answer. Okay, This is what we call an improper fraction. When the numerator is bigger than the denominator, in this case, 5 is bigger than 2. Now remember what you've heard me say, what you're going to hear me say a lot, all a fraction is is a fancy way of writing a division problem. You're going to get, when you start to have uh, math in 7th and 8th grade, even as you get into algebra, that when you see a fraction, you are just going to be expected to understand that that means division. And so I want to start teaching that now. Essentially, this is 5 divided by 2. So if I come down here where I have a little space, I'm going to rewrite the 5 over 2. I'm going to think, well, 5 divided by 2. Well, to make that work, I think, well, how many times can 2 go into 5? 2 can go into 5 2 times. If I take 2 into 5 2 times, I have 1 left over. Because I can think, well, 2 times 2 is 4. And then I still have 1 more to get to 5. My denominator here is 2, which means my denominator here is 2. I end up with 2 and a half. And that is actually the final answer that I'm looking for. All right, moving right along. 7 over 9 times 21 over 10. Sometimes there will be an improper fraction just incorporated into the problem. Doesn't change anything. Don't, don't change that now. Keep that the same now. We'll change it at the end. Because step 1 tells us we have to make everything a fraction anyway. So it is a fraction, so we're going to leave it alone. Step two tells us to cross-check. Well, I'm going to look at 9 and 21, and I'm thinking about my times tables, and I think both of those numbers are divisible by 3. So I'm going to do 9 divided by 3, and that's going to be 3. Then I'm going to do 21 divided by 3, and 21 divided by 3 is 7. So I'm going to change the 21 to a 7. I'm going to look at 7 and 10, and I'm going to think to myself, what number besides 1 can go into both 7 and 10. Well, I can't think of one. There isn't. There's no number besides 1 that can go into both 7 and 10. So I'm going to leave those numbers alone. 
So now I've cross-checked. Now it's time to multiply. 7 times 7. Well, 7 times 7 equals 49. 3 times 10. Well, 3 times 10 is 30. So I'm thinking, okay, now I once again know I have an improper fraction where my number 49 is bigger than my number 30. So I have a division problem, 49 divided by 30. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm doing this problem right here, 30 going into 49. Well, 30 cannot go into 4, but it can go into 49 one time. 30 times 1 is 30. 49 minus 30 is 19. There's nothing left to bring down. And I can have a remainder of 19 when I'm dividing by 30. How does this answer get translated into a mixed number? Well, 30 can go into 49 one time. When I take 30 into 49 one time, I see that there are 19 left over. My denominator here is 30, so my denominator here is going to be 30. All right? And I can see there's no number besides 1 that can go into both 49 and 30, so I can be confident that this is in simplest form. There's numbers that can go into 49. There's a lot of numbers that can go into 30. But the only number that can go into both is 1. All right, moving right along. Here's our first time now with a mixed number, 5 over 9 times 3 and 3 fifths. Well, the first step, as we know, is to make everything a fraction. Well, 5 over 9 is already a fraction, so I'm just going to leave that the same. Now, here's a mixed number that I have to turn into a fraction. This is a skill you should already know how to do, but let's review. When I take a mixed number and I turn it into a fraction, I take the denominator, which in this case is 5, and I multiply it by my whole number, which in this case is 3. So I do 5 times 3. Well, 5 times 3 is 15. Then I take that 15 and I add this numerator to it, which is 3. And 15 plus 3 is 18. So 18 is my number at the top. Once again, 5 times 3 is 15, plus 3 is 18. My denominator here is 5, so my denominator there is going to be 5. Now I want to think about cross-checking, and I notice now that I have two 5s. If two numbers are ever the same, it can be divided by itself. It doesn't matter how big or small these numbers are. What number can go into 5 and 5? Well, 5 can. So 5 divided by 5 is 1. 5 divided by 5 is 1. If you ever, when you cross-check, you have the same digit, the same number, cross them both off and make them both 1s. When I think of my division tables, I think, well, 9 is the biggest number that can go into 9 and 18. I could use 3 but I want to use the biggest number possible to give me the smaller numbers here. I want to make this problem as easy as I possibly can. So I'm going to divide these both by 9. 9 divided by 9 is 1. 18 divided by 9 is 2. Okay, and so now I'm ready to multiply. Well, 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 1 is 1, and I end up with 2 over 1. It's an improper fraction. A fraction is a division problem. All I'm doing is 2 divided by 1. Well, what's 2 divided by 1? 2 divided by 1 is 2. And sure enough, 1 can go into 2 two times, and none left over. So my final answer is 2. Moving right along, we got two more. Here's a combination, whole numbers and mixed number. Well, remember to make a whole number a fraction, I just make it over 1. So my 15 is going to become 15 over 1. I'm going to take my mixed number, I'm going to turn it into a fraction. 9 times 2 is 18. 18 plus 4 is 22. So my numerator is going to be 22. My denominator here is 9. My denominator here is going to be 9. Thinking about cross-checking, when I look at 15 and 9, I think, well, those are both divisible by 3. So I can divide them both by 3. 15 divided by 3 is 5. 
9 divided by 3 is 3. All right. Now I'm left with 1 and 22. Is there a number besides 1 that can go into both 1 and 22? Well, no, there's not. The first clue I get here is the fact that this is a 1. All right, so there's not much I can do there. So I'm going to do 5 times 22. That's a simple scratch problem that you can do. All right, 6th graders, you can do that. Okay, uh, I'm not going to, for time's sake, I'm not going to do the scratch work there, but some of you may have already figured out the 22 times 5 equals 110. Then I do 1 times 3. 1 times 3 is 3. Now, I know that I made these numbers as small as they can get. When I've made these numbers as small as they can possibly get, I can be confident that my fraction is in simplest form. But once again, we have an improper fraction where the Numerator 110 is bigger than the denominator 3, which means I'm going to have to make it a mixed number. Well, we know that a fraction is a division problem. This is going to be 110 divided by 3. So I'm going to have to come over here, 110, and I'm going to divide that by 3. Well, 3 cannot go into 1, but 3 can go into 11 3 times. 3 times 3 is 9. Then I do 11 minus 9. Well, 11 minus 9 is 2. Then I take that 0 and I bring it down. How many times can 3 go into 20? Well, 3 can go into 20 6 times. 6 times 3 is 18. 20 minus 18 is 2. I have nothing left to bring down. I have a remainder of 2 which works just fine when I'm dividing by 3. My remainder has to be smaller than the number I'm dividing by. How do I take 36 remainder 2 and turn that into a mixed number? Well, we, we see that 3 can go into 110 36 times. If I take 3 into 110 36 times, there are 2 left over. My denominator here is 3, so my denominator there is 3. All right, so 36 and 2 thirds. Last one, sixth grade. Uh, we got several different types. I just want to make sure you have exposure to them all. 3 and 1 over 8 times 1 and 1 over 3. Well, here we have two mixed numbers. So I have to turn both of these into fractions. 8 times 3 is 24. 24 plus 1 is 25. My denominator 8 gets moved down. So I come to this one, 3 times 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4, my denominator is 3, so that's going to be 4 over 3. I want to think about cross-checking, I look at the 25 and the 3, and I'm thinking what I know about my multiplication and division tables, there is no number besides 1 that can go into both 25 and 3, so I have to leave those alone. But 8 and 4... I'm thinking they're both divisible by 4. 8 divided by 4 is 2. 4 divided by 4 is 1. All right, so I'm just going to leave it like that. 25 times 1 is 25. 2 times 3 is 6. And I'm thinking, well, okay. 6 can go into 25. Improper fraction. 25 divided by 6. 6 can go into 25 four times. If I take 6 into 25 four times, there will be one left over. My denominator here is 6. My denominator there is 6. I get a final answer of 4 and 1 sixth. All right, that's multiplying fractions. Tomorrow, dividing fractions and mixed numbers. Sixth grade. Talk to you later. Bye.